You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Hey guys, welcome to the Choose If I radio podcast. Uh, today we are going to be talking with Michelle from Making Sense of Sense. And this is going to be an extremely cool episode because one, we're going to find out a little bit about her backstory. And then she is the, the prototype for what a digital nomad laptop lifestyle actually looks like. She's such a regular person. She documents her journey all along the way. She's one of the people that Brad pointed me towards as someone that has almost an outlier, someone that has figured something out that people aren't talking about. And this story is going to be wildly fascinating, both if you're inside the industry of blogging, but also if you're considering what are the possibilities when you decide to pursue an alternative income stream for you and your family that doesn't tie you to one specific geographic location. So to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, I'm doing well, Jonathan. Yeah, this story, Michelle's story has a little bit of everything. It's amazing. I think people are going to really love this episode. I mean, she has documented her journey since 2011 on her site. She actually has her income reports, which are fascinating to look at. And she started just like all of us from nothing. And even when she made it, quote unquote, big, as recently as three years ago, making $13,000 a month, that sounds great, but she is 10 X that in the last three years. I mean, she made $1.5 million from her website last year, 2017. That's not a typo, $1.5 million. So she is the epitome of how to build a digital business. And now she's living this wonderful digital nomad Phi type life where she's traveling the country in an RV with her husband. I mean, that is remarkable. So yeah, Michelle, welcome to the show. I can't wait to dive into your story. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to the podcast today. So Michelle, I mean, as we set up this preface, it comes across that both Brad and myself are amazed by what you've accomplished over the last several years. But I know it doesn't start with someone making $100,000 a month blogging. It starts with someone just being willing to stretch themselves outside of their comfort zone. And you are not a second or third generation blogger at this point. I mean, you, you didn't have someone to tell you this is what works, right? No, I didn't. I actually started making sense of sense back in August of 2011. And back then I didn't know like what blogs were. I didn't know that they can make money or anything along those lines. It was all just a hobby back then. What actually inspired you to even consider something like this? Yeah. So uh, my story is a little bit different than the average person's. I was actually reading a women's magazine, Cosmopolitan. In it, they actually featured a bunch of websites. And one of them was a personal finance website for women called dailyworth.com. I started reading that website and then I started reading the comments on all of their blog posts. And I noticed that there were a lot of financial bloggers commenting on the blog posts. I just started to become more involved in the personal finance community. I didn't have a blog yet, but I was reading all these great blog posts, reading about how people were paying off their debt and stuff like that. And eventually I started making sense of sense on Blogspot. Um, It was senseofsense.blogspot.com. It was free. It was just a hobby. Like I said, I didn't want to earn money from it. I didn't know that blogs could make money. Um, I just wanted to talk about how I wanted to pay off my debt and improve my financial situation. Were you in debt at the point when you started this website? Yeah. So that was like six years ago. So I was around 22 and 21, 22. And I started it just to talk about my student loans. I had around I want to say probably around $30,000 in student loans. And then right after I started my blog, I actually went and started working towards my finance MBA. And towards the end, after I received all three college degrees, I had around $40,000 worth of student loans. What's interesting to me is that blogging provides the perfect platform for somebody that is not a guru per se, but just somebody that is trying to figure things out as they go to document not necessarily this polished final product, but rather their 
continual iteration of their life, their continual process to get better in every single aspect. And, and what's amazing to me is, you know, this journey that you're on obviously creates the content or at least the beginning of the content for making sense of sense. Yeah. My beginning content is definitely interesting. It's definitely evolved over time. <laughs> and what did you find yourself writing about, you know, back in year one? Back in year one, it was mainly, uh, it was much more personal. I was anonymous back then. I was anonymous for about one and a half years. So um, I didn't use like any pictures of myself. I didn't use my real name, but I was able to talk much more freely about my money mistakes, like how much money I wasted that day or how I was feeling about my student loans and my financial situation and stuff like that. So I posted pretty much every single day for like the first six months. And it was just like short blog posts, like a couple hundred words and uh, just much more personal. How long did it take for someone to read your blog that wasn't your mom? Well, I was anonymous. So uh, no one I knew ever read my blog for like the first year to a year and a half. But since I was like in this little small personal finance community back then, it was there were like a lot of little personal finance bloggers reading my blog and we were all supporting each other to pay off our debt and stuff like that. So I actually had a pretty good following from right from the very beginning due to that great personal finance community. Michelle, how did you get involved in that personal finance community? Did you go to other bloggers and, and comment on their articles? Did you send them emails? How did you actually get into the community? Um, it all started from commenting on other people's blog posts. Like back then, it was an entirely different little niche when it came to personal finance blogging. Like you could find uh, like a great little community about everyone who was trying to pay off their student loans or pay off their debt in some way or just trying to be more frugal. And I was in that little community and everyone commented on each other's blog posts. Everyone uh, rooted for each other. Everyone was emailing each other about how they were doing financially and stuff like that. By commenting on a blog, that's how I initially got into that community. That's very cool. Yeah, we talk about the power of community here in all aspects of life. So that's interesting that that was your start. Are there any other ways that that community helped propel you to your future success? Yeah, definitely. Through that community, I eventually started reading like side hustling financial blogs. And that led to me uh, starting to notice other people's posting income reports. So I was reading blogging income reports. And that led me to realize that blogs could make money. And eventually, I earned my first $100 through my blog. And that had led to me creating my own income reports and making my own money blogging as well. So place that for us. When did you make your first $100 from your site? Um, I earned my first hundred dollars through making sense of sense around six months after I started the blog. A blogging friend actually emailed me and asked me if I wanted to make an easy hundred dollars by placing an advertisement on making sense of sense. And then once I realized that blogs could make money, it all just quickly grew from there. So someone comes to you that, you know, has is meeting you for the first time. That inevitable question of what do you do comes up and you say, I'm a blogger. And then that immediate follow up question is, how do you make money blogging? right? <laughs> yeah. So I get that question multiple times a day. Blogging is completely different than a normal business. I mean, you don't learn blogging at school or anything like that. So of course, that's a question that people would have. So for me, I earn blogging income in a few different ways. Uh, the top way is through affiliate marketing. So if I place a link on my blog to a product and a reader of mine purchases that product through my link, then I will earn a commission for it. So that's my top way. I earn around $50,000 a month through affiliate marketing. Eventually, I started making sense of affiliate marketing, which is my course that teaches bloggers how to make money through affiliate marketing because I was re receiving so many questions from other bloggers about affiliate marketing. So I created the course and that earns me anywhere from around $20,000 to $70,000 a month. Then the next way would be through advertising. So think like uh, AdSense. I don't use AdSense, but think like display ads on the sidebars of blogs or within a blog post. Um, that's around $3,000 a month. And then the other part of advertising would be like sponsored partnerships with companies. And that's around anywhere from around ten dollars to $20,000 a month. So one of the things as you're saying this that, that I'm realizing is that in order for you to have this diversity of income streams, and in particular with the affiliates, I'm sure there are some that outperform others, but you have to over time develop relationships with these people that give you access to these affiliate programs. Was there any particular way that you went about finding people to partner with you on your blog? And did you have any sort of, you know, process for as, as you were learning about this or did it all just kind of, you stumbled into one and then the next and then the next, that sort of thing. 
it was more just me stumbling into one and another. So I like to find affiliate marketing programs by seeing like what my readers want me to talk about, products that I love and that I'm currently using, and things that I think could help my readers. So I don't actively search out affiliate products. First, I try to solve a solution, solve a problem, find a solution, and that's how I usually find products to promote. I love that you led with that, that idea of solving a problem. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And the value that you're providing to your readers is there's a problem that people have. Usually they go to Google. And if you have provided a solution to that problem, over time, Google rewards you by ranking your page higher for solving that particular problem. But, you know, the affiliate marketing and all the income that comes in from that, it doesn't you, you get none of it if you have zero traffic. Why do you think that over time your particular content has become I guess the, the blogger word would be sticky. Why, why do you think that your site over the last several years has become the source for all of these different programs? I would say I've always been told that it's my conversational tone in my writing. So I write very personable. So when you read an article on Making Sense of Sense, I've always heard that it's like I'm talking to a person. It's not just like some generic blog post that's really boring about finance. It's usually I include my personal story, actionable tips and stuff like that. And it sounds like I'm just having a conversation with someone. So due to that, it's like much more enjoyable to read, I've always heard. And it's definitely much more enjoyable to write as well. So I'm very passionate about my writing, too. Michelle, that makes sense. And certainly your personality and that conversational tone does come through. But but when you really think about it, there are hundreds, if not thousands of other blogs that are similar in that regard. And, and yet they're not making $1.5 million. You, and I mean this in the most complimentary possible way, you have figured out the secret sauce to blogging and to making money. And it's, it's truly remarkable. Like it reminds me of something that Tim Ferriss says, which is, Try to find those people who are just getting outsized rewards for what you would expect based on whatever it may be. You know, obviously you could go to Michael Phelps for swimming lessons, but he's just a genetic freak, right? Whereas Tim Ferriss says, find the guy who is at a world-class level, but doesn't look like all the other swimmers. And I, I, again, I mean this, this is kind of a roundabout way. I mean this in the most complimentary way possible. Like you are doing something truly, truly remarkable. I wonder, like, have you ever reflected on that? Like, is there some secret sauce? Is it hard work? Like, how do you go from, we just, you know, fast forwarded from your story of making a hundred dollars to making $50,000 a month in affiliate marketing. That is not normal. Is there something that you could pass along, like actionable tip wise and like how someone would go from there to where you are now? I would say it's due to many different things, like the conversational tone, definitely. Some other things that I'm always doing and always working on is I'm always pushing out content consistently, whereas you might go to some blogs and they might pump out content a lot for one whole month and then they might not come back for another month or a week or something. I religiously post Monday and Wednesday every single week since I first started six years ago. So, I mean, the consistent content definitely helps. And then the other thing would definitely be quality content. I don't publish anything unless it's great. I'm always around two to three months ahead in content. So due to that, I can always make sure that content is great. I'm not trying to publish something the night before that's not so great, but I'm just trying to fill this Monday, Wednesday quota. So the quality is definitely something that is extremely important. And then the third thing is probably that Everything is very personal. I always share exactly what I did to pay off my debt, what exactly I did to side hustle my way to paying off debt and eventually turning that into my full-time business. So, I mean, I'm always including personal tips on exactly what I did. I'm a normal person. It's not like I'm like a trust fund kid or something like that. There's always those personal tips. I started from the bottom and now I'm here, <laughs> whereas I really don't want to say that, but I mean, that's exactly how it is. So I feel like people can relate to that. Yeah, that's an inspiring story. There's no question about it. I'm curious, when you get a couple months out in your content, do you have some type of editorial calendar? Like, do you generally take like a month and focus on a certain topic or is it just what comes across your mind? Like, how, how does your content strategy work? So I'm actually not super analytical. Like, I don't analyze what I should be doing. I don't do a lot of SEO or anything like that. It's mainly just what I come across. So if a reader asks me a question about something that I did or they need something solved in their life, I might try to fit it into the schedule. Um, I try to do one side hustle related post a week and one more like frugal budget type of blog post each week. So I try to do a good mix between the two, but there's no other rhyme or reason other than that. I think what would be fascinating 
is to kind of go through a stepwise process. I'm with you in terms of how you go about putting this information together. You know, it kind of builds organically. I can see that in the way that you write your content. But I think when we really dive into it, you would be able to say that there are certain, I guess, inflection points or light bulb moments that as you started to implement these ideas into your process, your business grew. And maybe it would be scaling yourself out of it and bringing on a VA to help you with some of the workload. Maybe it would be specific marketing strategies that you implemented. But I would love to hear, you know, as you go from $13,000 a month to 26 to 45 and now up to over easily over $100,000 a month, I would love to hear kind of what were some of those moments or those light bulb moments that you had that would benefit our audience? There's definitely different things I've done over the years. I'm constantly trying to improve the Making Sense of Sense business. Around six months after I started my blog, that's when I earned the first $100. Around one year after I started Making Sense of Sense, I was earning around, I want to say, somewhere between one to $5,000. And that's when I started to realize I could possibly turn this into a full-time job. So I started to spend a lot more time on Making Sense of Sense and improving it because I wasn't thoroughly enjoying my day job as a financial analyst. It wasn't super meaningful. The job was extremely stressful, but still very boring at the same time. And then I was really enjoying making sense of sense in my spare time. I've never had a job like it before. It's definitely still my most favorite career choice I've ever made. So I started to spend more time on improving the business. Around two years after I started making Sense of Sense, I was earning around $10,000 a month from it. And that's when I realized I needed to turn my notice into my day job. It's either I need to stop making Sense of Sense because realistically, there wasn't much more it could grow unless I was starting to sacrifice my quality at my day job. So it's either I had to choose my day job or making Sense of Sense, and I chose making Sense of Sense. So I started doing things like I paid off my student loans completely and I built up a really good emergency fund. I did that so that I could focus solely on making sense of sense, quit my day job and not worry about paying my monthly bills, worrying about a bad month or anything like that. So around September, October 2013, I left my day job and my income was around $10,000 a month. And most of that income was through making sense of sense. And then I was also earning a good amount of money from freelancing. So I was staff writing on other websites. I was managing social media, managing websites for other companies and stuff like that. Eventually I realized I was spread too thin. I wasn't spending enough time on making sense of sense. And I decided I had to leave my freelance clients. So around a year or two after I left my day job to blog full time, I decided I would leave all of my freelance clients as well because it was way too much work managing everything at the same time. And I was kind of sacrificing my making sense of sense business in order to help other people improve their businesses. So you will see like a jump in income from that. Like I think I I grew from like 10,000 to around 30,000 a month due to me leaving my freelance clients, like it jumped pretty quickly just because I was able to devote so much more time to making sense of sense. And then after that, I started to promote making sense of sense better. I was focusing on publishing even better, higher quality content on the blog. Um, I was focusing on building an email list and stuff like that. And I was around the $30,000 a month level for quite some time. And that's when I realized I needed to diversify. And that's when I started to think about creating my own product, my own course or something like that. I wasn't really sure. I eventually joined this mastermind and in it, there were two great course creators in it and they pushed me to start an affiliate marketing course, which is making sense of affiliate marketing. And then through that course diversification for the making sense of sense business, I grew my income from around $30,000 a month to around $80,000, $90,000 a month. And then that was like the next really big jump. And that's still like the main big jump that I took starting that course and diversifying my income and starting my own product. And then the next big jump after that to where I am today, which is around $100,000 to $130,000 a month, is when I started outsourcing more. So the other four or five years, I was a one person team. I did pretty much everything on making sense of sense. I would outsource little things like I might have needed a small little graphic to be done, or I had a small tech problem. But other than that, I was doing like 99.9% of the work myself. Early last year, I hired an editor, a part-time editor, and she helps me edit all my blog posts, saves me a ton of time. Um, And then I also hired a virtual assistant last summer. And by outsourcing those, just those two tasks, I was able to devote a lot more time to making sense of sense. And that helped me to grow my income to over $100,000 a month for the past 12 months. 
Wow. That is, that's incredible. And I love that you can kind of walk through and see these particular moments. And it's, it strikes me that there's several things in your journey that reminds me of my own personal choice. And when I left my job, and it's one of those is that, you know, you're getting close to the point where your side hustle or laptop business is paying your bills. And then you also are making, you know, that you can make up the difference either by going back into the workforce or potentially picking up freelance work in the field, because this business that you have on the backside is now acting as your resume as well. Those things really stood out to me. Was there ever a moment after you've left your day job where you had a you know a solid freak out and said, what am I doing? <laughs> so I definitely freaked out a lot before I left my day job. Like I was asking everyone, like, is this a good idea? This is a horrible idea. I didn't go to school or blog. I had three college degrees at the time and none of them were anything that had to do with like marketing or blogging. They were all financial analyst related, which is completely different from personal finance, especially completely different from personal finance blogging. So, I mean, there were definitely a lot of freak out moments. If you go back to uh, early 2013 on Making Sense of Sense, you will see all of these like freak out blog posts. Like, should I do it? Should I make the leap? Am I making a huge mistake? So, I mean, I definitely freaked out a lot before, but after I made the actual transition and turned in my notice and actually left my day job, I don't think there's even a single moment where I regretted it. It was a little scary leaving those freelance clients because that's what helped pay the bills, especially in the very beginning of when I turned into a full-time blogger. But it was definitely the best decision I've ever made. Michelle, I'm curious about your goals. When you were describing that, all these little inflection points, which was really remarkable to hear, you were saying, oh, I was making $30,000 a month, but then I joined this mastermind with course creators and then it jumped up or, you know, something to that effect. And I'm sitting there thinking, wow, you know, she's probably in her mid to maybe late twenties. She's making $30,000 a month from her, as Jonathan calls it, laptop lifestyle. Yet you have these remarkable goals that eventually made it 4X or 5X in pretty short order. Do you sit back and say like, here's where I want my business to be in a year, in five years, 10 years. What does it look like for you and and what are your future plans? So like I said earlier, I'm not super analytical. I just kind of like to go with the flow. So my motto for the last few years was just to say yes to everything. So I was saying yes to podcasting, yes to masterminds and stuff like that. By putting myself out there, I learned a lot about how to improve my blogging business. So like with that mastermind with those two course creators, I was actually asked to be in that. I didn't really think about creating a course. It just happened to be that I was in a mastermind with the two of them. And I was hearing about how great their courses were, how many people they were helping, the passive income they were making and stuff like that. So just hearing these little things in my life is pretty much what helps me improve the blogging business. I don't really set any firm goals. Like my goals this year for the business are to earn $2 million and to just work on a better work-life balance. But that's always my main goal for every single year to have the best work-life balance that I can. It sounds funny saying that right now because I feel like January is so crazy for a personal finance blogger because that's like the hot month for personal finance. So right now my work-life balance isn't wonderful, but I do love personal finance blogging. So it's something that I'm always working on. Right now, though, yeah, that's just my main goal, just improving that work-life balance, enjoying RV life, enjoying uh, traveling everywhere. You know, I think that's a great transition to talk about because the business that you created has freed you up from any particular geographic location. And I think you may be one of the only people I know that is a pure digital nomad. So you don't have a home base. You travel the country in an RV That is fascinating in and of itself. If we hadn't spent the first 30 minutes talking about, you know, your journey with your blog, we could have probably spent it just talking about this decision to be a digital nomad. And I'd love to hear, like, what inspired that? Was this something you grew up thinking, I want to try this? How does this happen that a financial analyst with a very safe IT job makes a decision to travel the country, travel the world in an RV? Yeah, so I never really thought about, like, traveling full time or anything like that. So around 2013, when I left my day job, we started traveling more. My husband left his job as a car salesman as well. So we started traveling more, but it was just out of our Jeep. So like we drove to Colorado in Utah, but it was just out of the Jeep and we were Jeep camping, tent camping and stuff like that. And around 2014, we decided that we should probably sell our house and move somewhere else. 
So in 2015, we sold our house. We put our house on the market in February, completely cleared it out, donated a ton of stuff, trashed a bunch of stuff, gave a bunch of stuff away. And we actually got a rental house in Colorado so that we could explore the Colorado area, Utah and stuff like that. And right after we got the rental house, we started to look at RVs. My husband has always wanted an RV. He was looking at RVs on Craigslist and stuff like little $2,000 canned hams and stuff like that. We went to an RV dealership. I stepped foot into my very first RV, and that was the, actually the RV that I bought. We bought that RV, brought it home, filled it up with our little things that we wanted to bring on a little camping trip. And we actually didn't go home for like a whole month after we bought it. So we decided to get rid of the rental house too and RV full time. And we've been RVing full time ever since. And it's been a little over two and a half years now. So Michelle, everything you own, is that in the RV? Like, do you have, you know, not to ask a stupid question, but like storage <laughs> units, like did you sell and donate everything? And this is like truly tiny, essentially tiny house living at this point? When we first decided to RV full time, we uh, had a little storage unit in the very beginning. Uh, we had it for around six months. We put everything that couldn't fit in the RV, like our furniture and stuff like that, into a little, I think it was like a 10 by 15 storage unit, but it was like really expensive. The town that we lived in, in Colorado, wasn't very big. So a storage unit was like $200 a month. So everything was in there for the first six months and it was super expensive. So we decided that we would get rid of pretty much everything in there and just put it all like the main things that we wanted to keep were like photo albums, like little childhood items and stuff like that. And we put everything into a closet at my husband's parents' house. And then they took all of our furniture and stuff like that. And they kept all the good stuff and we just put all our stuff in a little closet in there. But that's pretty much all we have now, just like photo albums. And we have some bikes over there and then everything else is inside our RV. That is so cool. I'm incredibly envious. You have no idea. I've, I've <laughs> talked about this on the podcast. I'm sure Jonathan was waiting for me to say this. My ideal life is like owning literally nothing, basically like clothes and a laptop. So yeah, when you're describing that, that is, uh, that's a, a future life goal of mine and maybe alternate life once my kids graduate from high school or something. That is really, really cool. So what does this RV look like? You know, you said you bought the first one you stepped foot into. How big is it? I'm really curious about like your actual physical living space. We're not in that same first RV. When we bought that first RV, we just thought it was going to be a part-time thing. We thought we would still live in Colorado and that we would just RV on the weekends or RV back home to Missouri, where we're from. So the RV was a little bit tinier and it works for plenty of people on a full-time basis. But for us, it was a little too small since we have two dogs and then there's two of us. But our first RV was a Itasca Viva. Um, it was like a 24-foot Class B van. It had a bathroom, a kitchen, a tiny bed, a dining area and stuff like that. But it was a little too small. So when we decided to full-time in an RV, we eventually upgraded. And right now we are in a 2016 Tiffin Allegra bus. It's around 37, 38 feet long and really good size, especially for two people and two dogs. We have like a big kitchen, a big bathroom, washer and dryer, dishwasher and stuff like that. So it's, it has all the comforts of home, but it's in a lot smaller of a space. I, Brad, I know that you as the aspiring minimalist are just running a fever pitch high right now, <laughs> but, but for the rest of us, I, I got to imagine that your family and friends to some degree are aware of your, your business that you've built on the internet. They're kind of contrasting that with this life choice to be a digital nomad and RV around the country. And I'm wondering, you know, what questions do they ask of you? And do you ever feel like you're having to defend your life choice? Or is this just such an obvious choice that everybody should be doing this? I'd love to get your perspective on this. It's interesting. It varies from person to person. Like everyone that we know, like our family and friends all think that it's really great that we are RV and we're digital nomads and stuff like that. But um, when you try to explain living in an RV while making $100,000 a month to strangers, they find it very confusing. A lot of people don't really understand RV life. I always joke that half of the people that I meet think RV life is really awesome. And then at the very opposite end of the spectrum, every other people think that RV life is completely odd and weird. It really just depends on who you're talking to. I do get a lot of questions about why I would live in an RV, but for me, it's like super obvious. It's really great. You can bring your home wherever you want to. You can look out your window and see um, awesome scenery. And I get to bring everything with me that I own. So it's not like I'm traveling and I ever have to worry about forgetting something at home. <laughs> so who drives more? Oh, I actually don't drive it at all. My husband does all the driving. 
And how often are you guys actually in transit or do you find yourself staying in particular areas? And I'd be curious if you do stay in a particular area, what particular areas are your favorite? So it really depends. We don't like have a strict schedule that we abide by. If we land somewhere and we end up really, really liking it, then we usually just extend our stay if we can. But sometimes we'll stay somewhere just for a day. And other times we might stay somewhere for a month or two. It really just depends. Uh, Like in the wintertime, we usually sit somewhere for a little bit longer just because it's colder everywhere else. We're not huge fans of the cold weather, at least I'm not. So in the winter, like right now, we are in Tucson, Arizona, and we will be here for probably around three months waiting for the rest of the country to warm up, especially since it's like Antarctica everywhere else right now. Um, (laughs) But usually in the spring, summer, and fall, we will travel a little bit more quickly. We might stay somewhere for around a week or a few weeks, but we're always on the move for the most part. Like in 2017, we traveled to 18 different states and three times as many cities. So, I mean, we're we're pretty much always on the move, always seeing new places. One of the things that I'm curious about, I feel like RVing is a skill set. It's not something that you just do and it just works. You have to do your research. You can't just drive somewhere and it just work. You have to know where your destination is going to be. You have to have specific parking areas that you're going to stay in. I mean, do you have any tips for somebody in terms of if they want to follow in your footsteps a little bit? What would be a good way for someone to find out how to get started with RV life? So it definitely depends on the person. So like with our first RV, we actually didn't really plan much. Like we would just show up places and see if we could fit somewhere. But that was a much smaller RV. And now that we're in an RV that's about 10, 15 feet longer, we definitely have to plan where we're going. But sometimes we still don't plan until like the day or week before. So it's not like a huge planning process, but you do need to make sure that you can fit into an RV park or fit under a bridge. That's like our worst fear, like coming across a bridge that's like a foot too short. There's definitely been some close calls were like 13 feet, three inches. And we've come across bridges that are like 13 feet, four inches. So, I mean, that's definitely something that you need to plan when it comes to RV life, but it's all pretty easy. There's lots of great apps. Uh, one of my favorite app is gas buddy. So our RV holds 150 gallons of diesel. So, I mean, that gas buddy app will tell us like where the next gas station is and how much their fuel is. So, I mean, that can save us a lot of money and a lot of time as well. But um, there's definitely some really good websites that I definitely recommend. Um, I really love HeathAndAlyssa.com for all RVers, any RVer who is wanting to earn money on the road. And then if you were wondering how to get online and in the RV world, my favorite website for that is RVMobileInternet.com. Um, both of those websites have tons of free resources, and I'm not an affiliate for either of them or anything like that. Um, they're just really great websites for RVers. So, Michelle, this sounds great in theory. Like, I, you know, I kind of joke about how I'd love to live in a tiny home or who knows, maybe even an RV after listening to you. But I'm curious, for someone who's actually doing this, are there any downsides? You know, you're living in an RV with your husband and two dogs. And I think some people reflexively would say, oh, wow, that's a tiny little space for four different family members, let's say. Right. Like, <laughs> what does that look like on a day to day, week to week basis? Yeah, I definitely get that question a lot. I definitely get the question, like, wouldn't you hate your spouse after living in an RV or such a small space with them for so long? For us, they're really, at least for me, there's not really any downsides of RVing. The space is plenty. It doesn't really bother us. If you want time on your own, you can just go outside and go for a hike, walk the dogs or something like that. So, I mean, there's definitely plenty of space, and that's because we use our surroundings outside around us as part of our space as well. Like we like to park where there's like great hiking trails, mountain biking trails, stuff like that. And that helps expand on our space and not make it seem like everything's so small. But overall, the small space does not bother us at all. One of the things that I'm curious about personally is you mentioned earlier that you struggle with work-life balance. And I think that is something that many people in the laptop lifestyle type space and obviously outside of that niche as well struggle with. And in particular for you, when your passion and your hobby also become your mainstream of income, I think the lines get blurred between when you're working and when you're not working. I know that's something that I see in my own life. It's something that Brad is constantly talking to me about and trying to help me put an end cap on when I'm actually focused on, you know, choose FI. And so I'm curious for you, since you're now on the road, you have this nomadic lifestyle and you've also mentioned that you struggle with that. I'm curious, how, what is that interplay there between you and your spouse, between putting the laptop away and then focusing on your hobbies? And then for him, since he's also on this journey with you, how does he deal with that as well? 
what I like to do is usually, so I wake up in the morning, I usually answer a ton of emails and I will work a little bit, but I usually try to enjoy the daytime hours towards wherever we are, hiking, mountain biking, taking the dogs on long walks and stuff like that. And then I will work again at nighttime. So that's usually the compromise right there. My husband goes on a lot of mountain bike rides and stuff like that. He's definitely enjoying the RV lifestyle. And that's definitely something I am always trying to work on. Blocking is a lot of fun, but it's really easy to stay connected. Like I could block from my phone, from my laptop. I don't need a hard line or anything like that. So due to that, I'm always working on work-life balance since it's so easy to stay connected and work 24-7 if I really wanted to. Yeah. And it's that ultimate paradox that in many cases you pursue the laptop lifestyle to free you from your nine to five. But then that same vehicle that allowed you to get out of the workforce never lets you you know, leave its side. You're never able to turn it off, which is why I always hear this work life balance theme. And now I, I identify with it as well. And so you've traded in one struggle for another. Yeah, exactly. Like I hear that a lot. Like, oh, you blog full time. Like you get to work from home. Like don't complain about that or whatever. But no, I'm blogging is great. And I'm definitely not complaining about it. But uh, like I've said, it's so easy to stay connected. So I mean, I could work from my bed, which I do like I will work before I go to bed. And when I wake up and stuff like that, it's just so easy to stay connected and bring your work everywhere with you. And that's also a negative as well, since you have to really work on that work-life balance. Yeah, Michelle, I, I totally agree about the work-life balance. And like Jonathan kind of mentioned before, I get on him about him spending too many hours on Choose a Vibe because this can be a 24-hour-a-day thing. You know, you can easily spend 168 hours a week on emails. And I know you have a Facebook group, I think, with almost 10,000 people in it. You could spend your entire life there. But I'm curious, do you look at, like, where you add value in your business? Like, I know you said you just added an editor and a VA, and that's probably made your life dramatically easier. But yet, you still can spend 24 hours a day. How have you taken a step back as a business owner and as the CEO of this really enormous business and said like, okay, this is where I want to spend my time. I am a firm believer in only doing what I actually want to do. So if something doesn't sound fun or enjoyable, or I don't think it'll actually help the making sense of sense business, I have no problem saying no. So right now, like I say yes to all interviews and stuff like that. And that's the main thing I'm working on. But for the most part, if I don't want to do something, it's just a no. Like I turn down speaking opportunities all the time just because I don't think that's what I want to do. I think that helps free up a lot of time because I know exactly what I want to do and what I don't want to do. That kind of goes along with the outsourcing thing. Like I outsource things that I'm not perfect at. Like I'm not going to edit my blog post because that's not my specialty. That's not what I'm great at. And I realize what my negatives are and what my strengths are. And I think that has really helped me improve my life and the business. I think this is a great opportunity to segue back into talking about the business for a few more minutes because One of the things that comes to mind is you have really made a dent in a marketing space that no one else is really competing in. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you identified Pinterest as a marketing vehicle and how you've leveraged that platform when so many other people ignore it. Yeah. So a few years ago, I started to become active on Pinterest. I just had like a personal Pinterest. It wasn't even for making sense of sense. I was just like pinning like recipes that I liked, clothing items that I liked and stuff like that. It had nothing to do with making sense of sense. Today, I just actually looked at how many Pinterest followers I have last night and I'm at like 99,000 or something. So I think I'll definitely be at 100,000 by the end of the month. And it all started when just a few years ago, I heard about Pinterest and I was just doing it on just for fun for me personally. And I realized that I could start pinning financial things for making sense of sense on Pinterest. And a lot of people told me I was wasting my time. Um, Pinterest wouldn't become big. Like none of my friends even knew what Pinterest was. And I was on it just in my spare time for fun. So, I mean, Pinterest wasn't as big back then. People didn't really know what it was. People didn't understand it. And people definitely didn't think you could post financial things on it. They, everyone just thought it was just for food and clothing and crafts and stuff like that. But I started pinning like how to make money in your spare time, 75 ways to make extra money and stuff like that. And that actually went pretty viral on Pinterest. I have tons of articles on Making Sense of Sense that have over 50,000, 100,000 Pinterest shares. And I think that's because I was one of the first people on Pinterest that 
is in the financial blogging area. So since then, it's just quickly grown from there. And I feel like almost all financial bloggers should be on it. And more and more financial bloggers are on Pinterest now. And I think it's all because people are starting to realize that Pinterest is so big. One thing I always like to tell people is that a lot of people think that Pinterest is just for females, but I recently read like 30 to 40% of Pinterest users are actually men. So, I mean, there's definitely a lot of room for growth when it comes to all blogging areas on there. So if you were going to give somebody just a couple tips on building a Pinterest marketing platform, do you have any specific actionable takeaways for somebody? Yeah, uh, my very top tip would be to work on your Pinterest graphics. A lot of people think like, oh, I can just pin any old graphic for my blog post and add it to Pinterest. No, that's not how Pinterest works. You need to have Pinterest worthy graphics. So like a Pinterest worthy graphic would be something that's eye catching. Black and white photos usually don't do as well. You want some color. But the main thing is that you want a vertical photo on Pinterest. Like a horizontal image does not work at all. If you go to Pinterest.com, you will see exactly what I'm talking about. You want a long photo. Usually if you add some words, that helps. But sometimes it really just depends on your niche. Sometimes just an image is great. But you want a really good description as well. So if I wrote a blog post on how to make money on the side, I will write out like 75 ways to make money on the side as my description and that is super helpful or I will say something like this is how I made $1,000 last month or something like that. You want your description to be super catchy. Some people just leave their description blank on Pinterest and that really hurts them as well. You definitely want a good image and a good description and those are my two very top tips. I have a confession to make that I'm going to go ahead and put on the show right now. Uh, My first website that I ever signed up for which as it happened was Choose FI. I saw Michelle's Pinterest ad for how to make a blog or how to, it was either, it was either one of your income reports or is how to make a blog. And I'm pretty sure that back in the day you got my Bluehost affiliate commission. So that there, <laughs> there it is. Choose if I is a direct beneficiary from your Pinterest marketing campaign. <laughs> Thank you. Glad to help. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure there's many other bloggers out there that are listening to this saying, yep, me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have one more follow up on that just because I know that you have had because of your time in the industry and because of your time building all these different platforms. I would love for you just to take maybe just a couple minutes and talk about the different social media platforms that you have tested and what moved the needle and what was a waste of time. So we talked about Pinterest, Facebook groups, Facebook pages, Twitter, Instagram. Just talk a little bit about how those have been involved in the growth of making sense of sense. Yeah, definitely. So um, around January of 2016, I decided I was going to start working on Facebook and improving Facebook traffic. So I mean, that was only two years ago. And even back then, people were telling me Facebook is dead. No one's on Facebook. Uh, Young people definitely aren't on Facebook. I was hearing all these things. It was a little scary because people, some people were earning great traffic from Facebook. And then everyone else was saying, if you're not already on Facebook, don't even waste your time. But I decided I would try wasting my time on it. So back then I had around 5,000 Facebook followers. And just two years later, I'm at around 85,000 Facebook followers. So just two years later, I have significantly grown my Facebook page. And I'm also earning receiving around 1,000 to 2,000 Facebook hits a day. So I mean, Facebook is definitely not dead. I don't think so. So two ways I have grown my Facebook are that I all, I have a Facebook page and I also have a Facebook group. So I have the Making Sense of Sense community group and I just started that summer of last year. And I definitely think those two things are something that pretty much all bloggers should have. A Facebook group is definitely something that takes up a lot of time to manage, but it can help you connect with your readers on a better level and create more engagement within all of your audience and your blog posts and stuff like that. So Facebook is definitely a favorite of mine. Another favorite social media account of mine is Instagram. So I don't receive like a ton of traffic from Instagram. Um, I would say like no more than 50 hits a day from Instagram. But I do love that I can interact with readers. I can show readers exactly what I'm doing each day. I feel like I can connect with them on a better level because they can actually see me, see my pictures and stuff like that. So I mean, whereas you might not receive a ton of traffic from it, it's a great way to connect on a better level and increase that engagement. 
another social media account that I sometimes use is Twitter. It's not like great for interacting with readers, or at least it's not for me, but it's a great way to interact with other people in your network. So think like other bloggers, companies, advertisers, and stuff like that. So I definitely recommend having a Facebook account, Instagram account, and Twitter account, just because they each have their own benefits and they all are great. But one thing I did try a long time ago, like a year or two ago, was Periscope. And I found that that was a waste of my time. I don't even know if Periscope's still around. But like back when it first came out, everyone was like, you got to be on Periscope. This is like the next big thing. And I'm glad I didn't really spend too much time on it because I don't even know if it's around still. But that's like the main thing that I'm glad I did not spend too much time on. Yeah, that's really interesting, Michelle, because I remember when Periscope came out and literally everyone was saying that, like, you have to be on Periscope three or four times a day. And I think that lasted for a couple of months. And yeah, I haven't heard anything about it ever since. So that's, yeah, kind yeah. of funny. <laughs> I, I love how you how you test all these different social media options. I'm curious how much time that you spend on these, like, do you sign up for courses? How do you discern, like, whether something's working or if it's not and where to spend your time. Like, you know, you've said Facebook and Pinterest seem to be the two best for you, but like, how did you determine and how quickly that Twitter didn't work or Instagram didn't work? So I automate a lot of my social media posting. So like Twitter's for the most part automated. I am active a little bit manually on there as well. Pinterest is almost entirely automated when it comes to Pinterest posting. And the same goes for Facebook. Almost everything is scheduled. So due to that, um, I feel like I could spend a lot of time on almost all social media accounts because they have great schedulers and stuff like that out there. So I don't have to manually be on Facebook five to seven times a day posting stuff. Same with Pinterest. I don't have to be on Pinterest 50 times a day posting stuff. So due to that, I feel like I can learn a lot about each different social media account and really improve on them. So time has never been a worry for me because I can really focus on one, learn all about it and apply those methods and schedule things. And I kind of do that one by one. Like I started out with Pinterest and then it was Facebook. Twitter's kind of just hanging out there. I don't really spend too much time on there. And now it's Instagram. So, I mean, I'm always trying to learn new things, but I feel like I'm probably going to stick to just Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest for now. There's definitely a lot of different social media outlets out there, but for me, I feel like those four are my four. So, Michelle, I'm curious, you're speaking to the FI community here. That's our audience. And while you don't necessarily write to the FI community, it certainly seems like you are either a part of the community or are certainly on the FI path, very obviously, right? Like you have no debt, you've paid off all your student loans, you live in an RV and you make a million and a half dollars plus a year. Where do you consider yourself on the FI journey? Do you consider yourself part of the community? And I I just love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I definitely consider myself a part of the community. Our big goal is to fully retire before 30, and we've definitely reached that goal. Um, I earn a great living through Making Sense of Sense, and we have saved a really good amount of that money that I've earned. After business expenses, we're saving over 95% of our income every month. So, I mean, even though we're earning uh, like $1.5 million a year, it's not like we're living extravagantly. We're not wasteful or anything like that. Like, we're still very... We're minimalist. We live in an RV, like I said, so we don't waste a lot of money on anything. We are definitely going to be able to retire at any time whenever we want. But for now, I am still really enjoying making sense of sense. So I don't see that ending anytime soon. But having the option to retire when and if I want to is definitely something that I'm glad that I have. I love it. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing all this actionable content. I don't know. This one interview has turned into this amazing resource for people that are looking. How do I 10x my blog that I just started maybe last week? What does that journey look like from someone that's maybe five or six years ahead of me? And I love just how honest and frank you are with the different light bulb moments you've had on this journey. Thank you so much. It was great talking about all of this. I'm going to tie this back to something that we mentioned earlier because I think it's totally appropriate. We mentioned one of the things when you're building a course is you solve a problem. And I think so many people are wondering, you know, if I decide to build this blog or start this blog and right now maybe I'm doing it anonymously and I'm just I'm talking a little bit about my journey and it's a way for me to chronicle my progress over time. There will be for most people a point at which they say, I wonder if I can earn an income from this. I think for many people listening to this podcast, they've realized that instead of trying to figure it out all on their own and learn by 
failing and falling flat on their face, they might like to get an abbreviated course and have someone show them exactly what works based on a tried and true system with income reports to prove it. And since I know you've put together this affiliate marketing course, I'd be curious, what is a way for someone to find out a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, I mean, if you want to learn about affiliate marketing, um, I definitely recommend heading to making sense of affiliate marketing.com. It's an affiliate marketing course for bloggers that I started back in July of 2016. So it's been around for almost one and a half years, almost two years. And there are over 3,500 students. The refund rate is less than 1%. So pretty much everyone loves the course. I hear such great reviews. The Facebook group is super popular and super helpful. So if you want to learn how to make more money from your blog, this is definitely the course you want to take. So before I started making sense of affiliate marketing, I interviewed uh, various bloggers around me, some who were new and didn't have many page views and others who had over a million page views. And I asked them how much money they were earning through affiliate marketing. And surprisingly, a lot of them said that they weren't earning anything and they thought affiliate marketing was a waste of time. I realized a lot of people thought that affiliate marketing was as easy as just slapping a bunch of affiliate links on your blog and calling it a day. And that's pretty much all you had to do to earn affiliate income. And I realized that a lot of people did not realize that you needed to have a real strategy when it came to affiliate marketing on your blog. So I decided to launch Making Sense of Affiliate Marketing so I could teach people exactly how I was earning over $50,000 a month through affiliate marketing. Um, And I teach my exact strategies. So I go over why affiliate marketing is great, like just as a great introduction, how affiliate marketing works. Um, And then I really deep dive into... um, how to apply affiliate marketing to your blog, how to find those great offers, how to find out what your loyal audience and what your readers actually want to hear from you when it comes to affiliate marketing. And I go over like little tidbits, like how to increase your conversion rate, building a relationship with your affiliate managers and stuff like that. So I go over pretty much everything that there is to know about affiliate marketing for bloggers. And it's a really great course and I definitely recommend it. Brad, I think I would like to sign up for that course and we can just call it a, call it a business expense, right? Hey, sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm clicking the link. All right, we're going to yeah. set up a link for that in the show notes if you want to go check out the course. And it'll be chooseify.com slash Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E. Did I get that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, well, normally that would be the end of the episode, but on this show, we'd like to give you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? Yes, I am. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation, these questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. All right, Michelle, question number one, your favorite blog that's not your own. So that's a super tough question. I definitely have different favorites depending on what I'm learning about. So I really love like thinksaveretire.com. For minimalism, I really love Kate Flanders. For early retirement, I really love Our Next Life. For like truth and like truth bombs and stuff like that, I really love like Club Thrifty. They really tell you how it is. And then um, I have to do a little plug for my sister's blog, which is fitnantials.com. <laughs> fitnantials.com. Yep. Nice. Nice. Yeah, we'll have links to all those in the show notes for sure. And is that last one with your sister's blog, is that tying together the finance and the the health aspect as well? Well done. Yes, it does. They do go hand in hand. All right. Question number two, your favorite article of all time. So on my website, my favorite article at the moment is why would you make $100,000 a month and live in an RV? Um, I get that question a lot and it was definitely a lot of fun writing that one. Very cool. Michelle, question number three, your favorite life hack. I don't really know if this really counts as a life hack, but my favorite little thing that I recommend that all people do is if you're really wondering, like, if you're wearing all of your clothes and if you should get rid of stuff, I recommend reversing all the hanging clothes in your closet. And as you wear an item, flip the hanger in the other direction. So then at the end of the season, you can see exactly what you haven't worn, what you are wearing and so on. So that you can see what you should sell or donate. And do you find that your closet is is relatively minimalist at this point? 
It is, especially since I live in an RV. I used to do that life hack all the time when I lived in a house, but now I like don't really buy much clothing, so I don't really have to do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, we didn't really throw up the the exclamation point there and say, you have a 95% savings rate. I mean, it's a little bit simpler when you're generating up to $100,000 a month, but I got to say, just as a percentage, I think that is the highest percentage that we've heard yet, and you certainly are resisting the temptation for lifestyle inflation. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm very happy with what we're saving and we're still living a really great life. I know that our income is definitely higher than the average person, but um, we're saving a great amount and still living a great life. All right. Question number four, your biggest financial mistake. That's definitely when I took out too much in student loans back in college. (laughs) Yeah, I can sympathize with that for sure. All right, Michelle, question number five, the advice you would give your younger self. Um, so some advice that I'd give like 18 year old Michelle would probably be to stop buying so much clothing and food and actually budget and probably think about how much in student loans you are taking out. So I wasn't like the best with managing money when I was, um, 18 and just moved out on my own and just started college and stuff like that. And made a lot of money mistakes. Thankfully, my credit card limit was only $300. So I couldn't take out any too much credit card debt but I didn't have the best money management skills. All right. So we do have one additional question and this is a bonus question. The reasoning behind this was we spend so much time talking about spending less, right? But in reality, all of us have moments in time where we splurge on something. And I'm curious, what was your favorite purchase made on Amazon over the last year? So that's a really tough question because I don't shop on Amazon a ton and I live in an RV, so I'm not really buying a ton of stuff. But the other day I did buy a bunch of dog toys on Amazon and those are definitely my favorite purchase as of recently. <laughs> what type of dogs do you have? Uh, we have a Brittany Boxer mix and then the other one's a French Bulldog. Very nice. I have a Boston Terrier and we want a Boxer at some point, so we don't have one currently. Oh, nice. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing this, all this information with us. I know we talked a little bit earlier about the way that someone can find out more about your course, but what if someone wants to connect with you? What's the best way for someone to reach you? The best way would be to go to makingsenseofsense.com. On there, if you go to the right hand top side, you will see like all of my social media accounts. If you want to follow my RV travels, I definitely recommend going to instagram.com slash Michelle Schro. And if you, I have a Twitter, Pinterest, great Facebook community and everything. So definitely just head to makingsenseofsense.com and you'll see all the other links and definitely follow me everywhere that you want to. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right, guys. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to this episode today. I hope you got value from this. You need to realize that there are people that have found a way to live this alternative lifestyle and totally thrive far beyond anything that you could ever imagine. And Michelle, even in this subset of people is an outlier in that she has figured something out and polished it and is totally crushing the game. Hopefully by listening to this episode, you understand a little bit of what's happening behind the scenes and armed with this information, you have yet another tool to add to your toolbox that will allow you to break free of the hamster wheel and design a future that you can get excited about. If you got value from this episode, just take one second and press the subscribe button on the platform that you're listening to this on. It just lets the provider know that you're getting value from this show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. Thank you so much for listening and thank you for being a part of the community. If you want to support us, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. If you want to do that, just go to chooseify.com slash iTunes. Two, use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to chooseify.com slash cards and get started today. Three, if you're working on the milestones of Fi, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free and just go to choosefi.com slash PC. P is in Paul, C is in Cat. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 38, The Why of Fi, and right behind that, have them go listen to episode 21, The Pillars of Fi. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.